everybody. I welcome you back to the uh, Decentering ELT Opportunities and Challenges Conference, which um, uh, the Hornby Trust is uh, hosting together with um, INET, uh, teachers, uh, T Association of English Teachers in India, and um, Dr. Uh, Ambedkar University of, in Delhi. And um, uh, Amal, Amal, would you like to uh, take over? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And uh, I join Richard in welcoming everyone back to the conference. We had a very fascinating first day yesterday when uh, various teacher associations and uh, their representatives from different parts of the world presented their case studies, uh, illustrating certain practices in which decentering element was quite visible. Today, we are going to start with a panel discussion on uh, understandings around decentering. And I'm happy to welcome Paula Rebelodo, uh, uh, who will be moderating and leading this panel discussion. So welcome Paula and over to you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you everybody. Welcome on day two. Um, I'm very sorry that um, I wasn't able to join you yesterday. I just, um, I had problems, um, international problems. <laughs> I was flying, so. I'm sorry that I, I could I just missed the the discussion, but I was able to listen to the discussion later. Um, um, what we are planning to do today is to have a discussion about um, 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 our panelists' own understandings of decentering ELT. Um, so this is going to be a lively discussion. It's not going to be a structure in a way of question answer question answer is going to allow just the panelists to uh, openly express their views and perceptions about what the centering ELT means uh, to them um, and then after that we are going to allow for more um, open discussion from them again for them to continue um, expressing their views on the topic based on what other uh, fellow panelists uh, mentioned and then after that we are going to allow for some questions from the audience. I'm always going to help us gathering questions uh, through the different channels um, where we are transmitting this, uh, this conference. So um, just for you to know how the, how the panel is going to be structured, okay? So once again, welcome everybody for joining us. Welcome our panelists and thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation to participate. Um, so, um, from our group of panelists, um, I'm not going to read all their bio data because their they are, they are, uh, they're, they're, um, records are so interesting that it will take me a long time to mention all their accolades. So, I'm just going to briefly mention uh, their name, their country, and what they are currently doing at the moment. If you want to know a little bit more about them, their full bio data is in our program. So first we have Eric with us. Eric is from Cameroon. He is a lecturer at the Higher Teacher Training College in Yaoundé in Cameroon. So thank you very much, Eric, for joining us and for accepting our invitation. Thank you very much, Paula. I'm happy to be here and glad to see um, Sri, Prem, Grazia, Amol, Richard and yourself. Um, I look forward to an exciting discussion this afternoon. Thank you, Eric. And then it's also with us representing Latin America. We have Gracia Mendoza from Honduras. Um, and she is an education specialist for the US government and USAID Honduras supporting public education and working in partnership with the Ministry of Education in Honduras. Thank you very much, Gracia, for joining us. So happy to be here today and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Gracia. And we also have here with us Shresh. He's from India. He is, um, when I was reading your, your bio data, I was like, wow, that's very impressive. He's an examiner, examiner trainer, monitor, trainer of trainers. But he, uh, when we had a conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago, he said, but I'm mainly a teacher. And right now my, my role is I am a teacher at a school in India. So thank you very much, Shresh. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Great. Thanks for the chance you gave me. May God bless you all. Thank you. And then last but not least, we have Prem. Prem is a good friend of ours. Uh, Prem is from Nepal. He works at the Chinese University of Hong Kong as an assistant professor of applied linguistics. Thank you very much, Prem, for being with us today. 
Yeah, thank you, Paula, and thank you, everyone. Okay, so we are going to start, and uh, what we are going to do to begin, um, I haven't assigned anybody like a time. Oh, Hasna, Hasna is here. Uh, I'm yeah. so happy to see you, Hasna. Hasna has been having problems in, uh, connecting. Um, so Hasna um, we, is with us today. She's from uh, Palestine, and she uh, works for the Palestinian Ministry of Education as an English teacher. And uh, thank you very much, Hasna, for being with us today. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And so um, having almost a full uh, board of panelists, we are going to start our discussion. I'm going to just pose a question and I'm going to give each of them room to um, talk about uh, their own understanding. So the question that they're going to try to answer, even though it's a very open general question, is what are, what, what are your understandings of the centering ELT? What do you understand of the concept? What are your perceptions of it? Um, so with that question in mind, I'm just going to give the floor um, first to Gracia, since you were the first time who arrived. Let me, uh, let me start with you, uh, since you've been here for the longest period of time. I hope you are okay with that, Gracia, is that okay? And yes. so let's just start with you, Gracia, and then we will continue with the rest. Thank you, thank you, Paola. And thank you, Richard and Mo, for the opportunity to be here and share about our context, and especially to share our perspectives on decentering ELT. And thank you to the whole organizing team for having us today. So today I wanna to share the perspective of our region and my context in particularly regarding decentering ELT and what this looks like and how this view can contribute to the, res the research that has been conducted. And I want to bring two perspectives into this discussion that I think and consider are important. And one has to do with access. And when I talk about access, I'm not only considering materials or resources or training or information that is contextually adapted, but I'm talking about the access that teachers can have to improving their own proficiency, to access comprehensive ongoing professional development. And the reason I'm saying this is that in our context, the context where we work, we have a great divide in how language professionals access quality professional development and training. For example, we have a great divide between public school teachers and private school teachers in the way that they are accessing materials or even grasping the potential of adapting these materials to their own context and needs. The access in the public school system for our country and for teachers to have ongoing professional development is limited. They don't have opportunities to enhance their own proficiency skills. And most of the times, public, public school teachers in our context, and this is the case for Central America and Latin America as well, are sent to the English classroom without having enough proficiency, without being prepared for that context, and they're not provided the training either. So when we are thinking about how do we localize uh, materials, resources, and training, we need to think about also the way that they are accessing possibilities of certification or enhancing their own qualifications. And we have these public school teachers that annually, they have to provide proof that they are being certified or that they are being uh, get, accessing professional development, but they're not getting the access. And then we have the private school teachers who have access to comprehensive professional development. They have access to a lot of resources. They have access to uh, improving their own linguistic proficiency. They have access to communities of practice. And just recently, as I was reading and preparing for this session, I was reading about a world ranking for uh, EF, EF English Proficiency Index. And they were stating that Honduras is in the top 10 countries where the best English is spoken uh, in Latin America, along with Argentina and some countries in South America. And I'm pretty sure that in evaluating the levels of English, the adults that were evaluated came from private bilingual schools, and that was the source of their information. So, however, and, and, and if you think about this, it's not providing the real context of what's happening in the country or in the region, because only a small proportion of learners of English go to bilingual schools. 
uh, we have 23,000 public schools. We only have around 1,000 private bilingual or monolingual schools where there's access to English. So the ranking did, does not describe the reality of what is happening, but it emphasized, this report emphasizes one thing that I think is relevant to this conversation, and it's the fact that learning English enables uh, professionals to have access to a variety of opportunities and that it levels the playing field. And then my question is, how can the playing field be leveled if everyone doesn't have access? And then thinking about the access that teachers have to all the needed professional development, resources, then how does this impact the learners? And that's the second perspective that I want to bring into the discussion. Because if teachers don't have the access, if teachers don't have the resources, that's gonna create a huge impact in the language classroom. And we're going to continue to have that gap between learners who attend public schools and those who attend private schools. And generation after generation, this will continue to result into lack of opportunities. It means that we could very well localize bring the national identity to materials, resources, and practice. We can uh, empower the local expertise in a variety of ways. But if our teachers don't have the opportunities, 100%, our language teachers don't have all of them, the opportunity to access these materials, then we are going to continue the preventing the equity and inclusion that we are searching in this process. So that's my, the first thoughts that come to mind. Thank you, Gracia. Thank you very much for an interesting um, for an interesting take on decentering. Um, I'm taking notes uh, just uh, just to, to to keep record of uh, different points that um, the different panelists are raising. So um, thank you for that. We are going to continue now with our second panelist. Prem uh, um, has joined us. He's a good friend of the Hornby family. So uh, Prem, I would like to give you some um, time also to provide your perspective on this entry ELT. Thank you, Prem. Um, thank you, Paula, and thank you, everyone. I, I think it's very uh, difficult question to, to respond, actually. And uh, my experience ba is basically based on uh, my work as teacher, teacher educator, and researchers in, in one of the very, uh, very contexts of ELT. So that's, that's Nepal. So I think uh, when, we, when we talk about decentering, I think it means many things for many people. And uh, just, we don't really have to agree on our ideas. And if we really kind of think of having consensus of what it is, then again, it's not decentering actually maybe we are more focused on centering and looking into solutions so that's why decentering in ELT or decentering of ELT uh, for me is basically questioning what uh, we have been actually doing for long in different parts of the world right so the questioning basically begins with what is the center of ELT or what is the center in ELT where is the center or the, is the center actually fixed? So for me, it is not just like a fixed geographical location. Um, rather, it is very dynamic and socio-culturally constructed space of people where we are actually connected in and by ELT, for example. So including uh, English language teachers in schools, university professors or researchers or parents, right? So, there are multiple centers for me. So, um, and th these centers are actually, uh, these centers exist in peripheries as well. For example, universities as a center of English language teaching, a language schools as a center of English language teaching, or even teacher associations could be at the center of language uh, AELT, for example, as we are discussing now. So, decentering in the sense, uh, is a concept or it's kind of maybe an overarching concept that helps us understand a very kind of dialectic relationship between the center and the periphery. And basically for me, it really engages us in negotiating and repositioning our own values and skills uh, in relation to the context where, uh, where we work. So, um, 
basically um, it's, it's like questioning and um, it, it, for me, so the basic questioning lies in, uh, in, in ELT. So what basically lies at the center of decentering ELT is, is um, I, I think, so what actually ELT is and how it should be implemented is it's a kind of main question for me. So for example, some useful questions uh, in addition to what I have raised before, could be, um, you know, is ELT about learning English that is used in the centers? I'm talking about the language, English language used in the center, for example, uh, as we have read in uh, practice like USA, UK, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, or should be more than that, right? Or should our approaches be monolingual or multilingual? Right? These questions are not really value neutral. So they are very much like value-based and ideological. And these questions are not actually new indeed. And there are different scholars like uh, Katsuru. Uh, we are familiar with his contribution in ELT, Kumara, Kumara Badavelu, Suresh Kanagaraja, particularly in South, uh, sorry, uh, this uh, Indian subcontinent, have long been questioning this, this kind of like center-based approaches in ELT and the ideas of world Englishes, for example, a post method pedagogies and the integration of local knowledges and cultures uh, provide a very different, I, I think very powerful decentering perspectives in English language teaching. So what I'm basically uh, asking here or raising, I think rather than responding to your question, Paula, what I'm basically asking is, um, you know, what actually lies at the center of ELT? So, that that should be basically question, and then uh, maybe we need uh, more kind of diversification of our understanding about ELT by basically looking into not just recognizing but looking into the relevance of the knowledges and practices that are actually been uh, have been part of a kind of English language teaching for long. As I as I gave examples. Uh, for example, uh, local knowledge is, or culture or the use of different varieties of Englishes in different parts of the world, even the locally, uh, locally produced materials and all those things. So um, I think um, decentering for, um, you know, the de decentering project, the first I think should begin, again, we, we, we don't need to agree on this, but uh, we need to ask ourselves, you know, or we need to really raise the question of the relevance of monolingual ELT that actually dominates our, our perspectives about ELT. For example, ELT material production, ELT teaching methods, ELT uh, uh, research, and all, all those things, even teacher development, right? So um, I think we need to look into the recent development in the multilingual tron in TSOLs or ELT that offers very alternative, uh, very powerful and relevant alternative decentering insights in, in ELT. So I think I will stop uh, Paula here and then if you have any questions, so maybe we'll come back. Thank you. Thank you, Prem. Sorry, let me pause my timer. Everybody has been very good and on time. <laughs> uh, spot on. Thank you. Thank you, Prem, very much. That was very interesting. I was, um, uh, there are definitely um, a lot that we could discuss from both perspectives because they are different and that is why the discussion could be so rich. They're very different perspectives and um, that is probably what we were looking for in this discussion. So I'm going to continue now with Eric. So I'm going to leave uh, the room for you to, um, to uh, share your views, uh, your understandings of uh, decentering ELT. Okay, thank you very much, Paula, um, co-panelist. I'm very honored to be here this afternoon. Um, I have been trying to uh, look at various components of decentering ELT. And the first thing that comes to my mind is that um, for us to understand uh, the decentering practice, uh, there is a possibility of us trying to understand where the center margin ends. Um, that's where we start looking at decentering. Um, when Palmer traveled to Asia and discovered that the process of learning English 
out there are not consistent with what he had experienced in the UK. That was an indicator that there is something in the periphery that which is not in the center. And what I understand is that we, what we are doing now is trying to understand that ideology of local practice, local practices that link with local experience. So I'll be trying to look at whether this is something very realistic. From this, we, we understand that the centering itself, we on try, we, what we are doing now, we are trying to understand the practice. It's something that has been going on and there's a lot of it that is going on out there, which we have just limited uh, data or insufficient information, which can help us um, capture the whole scope of the ideology. Um, if, if, you, if you look at the case studies that we have already, there is a possibility for us to generate the idea that decentering in one way is a form of critical pedagogy. Um, why do I think it's a form of critical pedagogy? This is a strategy that is used to, um, to be locally relevant and in ways that do not necessarily match with the kind of training practitioners have received or the kind of ideology which is prevalent in the context. And what that also means is that the dynamics of the local context define how the centering fares. Um, if we understand this, there is a possibility for us to also hypothesize that the centering is widely diversified. If we have to understand the practice of the centering, we are just at the beginning because it's just going to be highly diversified. The local practices, the, lo the local di dynamics are never going to be um, common. They're never going to be common. So they determine if, if they have a determinant effect on practice, then these factors are far from common. Now, what we should be trying to understand is what is it that cuts across the different context which we can draw as a starting point for hypothesizing, or let me say, understanding the line in the centering. This is the other factor. When I, when, I go, when I get back to the case studies, I realize that what we are trying to do now is to knowledge what has been happening. The, the studies in, in uh, the study reported by APIBA, uh, CLAS, um, and from Nepal and other countries. These are things that are being done by practitioners, but it's one thing which we need to bring into, bring, bring to the table. Most of these case studies have not yet given us an impact assessment. And a fair impact assessment can be obtained from learner achievement. So we must also I think it, it would make sense for us to try to get into what kind of achievement is made from the centering practices to be able to uh, settle on what potentially holds as uh, a main ideology in the centering. What we understand in this, in the periphery is that look, training, teacher training, practically follows orientation from the center. Why? Because most of the trainers, it's either they were trained by um, Eurocentric or the center, from a center perspective, and they're transmitting this to teachers. But what is happening, what the teachers are doing 
they are not trying to counteract what they were trained to do, but at the same time, they are not implementing what they were trained to do exclusively, but they're trying to find their own way of doing it in a, in, in a way that can lead to success. So there is a kind of um, trying to find your way by not accepting what you have been asked to do and, and trying to achieve maximum effect in what you are doing. That to me makes a lot of sense if we have to understand a dissenting. This equally means that if we have to um, assess the value of dissenting, then we must also have to find a way of checking how these practices reorientate training, the kind of training which teachers get from training colleges. That in a way will be expanding the scope of dissenting and trying to see how um, the trainers themselves can generate um, ideologies and practices that run from training to practice and which have an Im impact on what learners are capable of doing. Now, there is, to me, um, it seems to me as though we, we would need to find a way to document the different decentering practices which are hidden. Um, I remember um, in one of our community conferences, um, one of our guest speakers said, teachers have written tons of books on the chalkboard and have erased them at the end of the day and nobody knows this. This is uh, Eric Dwyer from uh, Florida uh, University. And I have this imp impression that if we don't find a way of documenting these practices, we are just starting decentering because there is a, a whole lot of it that we need to put together and then look at, at the, study the data and try to knowledge it and find a way that we can be able to define what decentering itself means. Lastly, Paula, um, I was I, I start when I when I got this concept, uh, decentering in a meeting in Liverpool, I, I started thinking that this could be a methodology. But uh, when I look at the case studies, and then I, I, I work with teachers in Cameroon, and I find uh, I find I see how teachers are generating um, knowledge to overcome challenges, and the knowledge not knowledge because they've been taught to do it. Uh, I realize that it's far from being a methodology. We can't qualify it as a methodology. I started thinking whether it could be an approach, but when you look at the limits of an approach, when you look at the, the definition of approach, an ELT approach you realize that decentering extends the ideological orientation of ELT approach or ELT uh, uh, teaching approaches because it doesn't actually fit in a particular space. And it doesn't actually tell the teacher that when you're going to class, go and decenter, it doesn't. Now the teacher gets to the classroom and finds himself in a situation in which he thinks that, well, the best way to solve this problem is to make it work. And if it works, then I go home with something that in itself is decentering. So I want to stop here for the moment and maybe come back if you um, create this space for me again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for that. Um, we have lost um, Hasna. I hope she can join us again soon. Or oh, she's there, but, but I cannot see her fully on screen now. Um, I don't know if anybody in the team could help me make her a panelist. Are you as a panelist, Hasna? Yes, you are there. Thank you very much. So I'm going to continue now with uh, um, Shresh, and then I will move on with you, Hasna. Is that okay? So Shresh, if you could uh, use your time to um, share your views about um, uh, decentering ELT. You are muted still. There you go. Okay, am I audible now, please? Yes, you are. Yeah. Thank you, Paula. And uh, thanks to colleagues and my greetings. This is a very pleasant, cold, pleasantly cold evening in North Bihar near Indo-Nepal border. 
and uh, allow me to go a little bit, bit personal. You know, today I taught at the school where I teach, and I had 38 children, about 25 girls, 12 or 13 boys, all between 8 and 12 year old. Close to 80% of them. And, you know, by now they are expected to be fluent readers of books done by government textbook committees. But close to 80% of them cannot read a word, cannot write their own or their parents' names using Roman using letters of the Roman alphabet. And we must acknowledge that in India today, let alone the world, in India today, we have hardly a future without adequate proficiency in English. English is no longer a British language in India. It's another Indian language. More than 220 million people have claimed it is their preferred second language, which means it overtakes Hindi. All business, all jobs, even marriages are made keeping in mind whether the bride and the groom are proficient in English. Some colleague just now raised the question of access. So the problem is, how do we create access for these 38 children, you know? And this is where I would like to come and say what decentering means to us in this village, in one of the most backward areas of the world. Decentering here to us means finding a local solution to a global problem. The problem is the same, learning a non-native language. But we will have to find a local solution. How do we create access? <clears throat> How do we sustain motivation? How do we create adequate exposure? And what kind of curriculum such that can be implemented using local resources, using untrained teachers? Just now, my good colleague, Eric, talked about teacher training. What kind of teacher education? You know, unfortunately, we don't create trained teachers, we create trained workers. They are good only at delivering a given syllabus. But you know, we will have to be, we'll have to innovate. We'll have to be imaginative enough to find local solutions to global problems. We'll have to see what our untrained teachers how little of training can be adequate for them. India, unfortunately, still follows the British days practice of producing a trained graduate teacher in two years. That's a luxury India can no longer afford. It has over 330 million school students in government schools alone waiting to learn English and teach a trained teacher output is under 30,000. Just imagine the kind of staggering problem that confronts India. The only way we can do it is by decentering, finding our own local solution. Let's meet again and again. All of us may not know, you know, may not be equally fluent or proficient in the English language. But if you know about 500 words, if there is a 
lady here in the village, if there is a retired worker, a bank clerk in the village who knows about 2000 words in English, then we can invite that teacher and ask that teacher to share those words, share that knowledge. Luckily, Paula, we in India have a rich tradition of finding local solutions. You must remember when the British arrived here in the 17th century, nobody knew English. When they got power in the mid 18th century, nobody knew English. But by the end of the, end of the 18th century, they had started you know, creating glossaries, word lists. They, they experimented with translation of Indian accents into English. They, they found, you know, the, I mean, some of these direct methods and indirect methods began in India. Alexander Duff was a priest, a Christian priest in Calcutta who began direct method. He would draw a fish on the board and ask his students, Bengali speaking students, point, you know, put a pencil upon the eye of the fish and would ask what that was. And the students would say, Bangla word for eyes, and he would give eyes. Come to South, Madras, you know, Bell's method, monitor model. Senior students can teach their younger friends. So today in India, we need to invent and use all of these things, grammar translation, monitor, you know, senior students helping under, you know, their younger friends. What we also must at the same time remember, India has some of the best learners of English. You talked about British Council and my experience in examinations with them. I have some access to those data, you know, we have in Indian students have the highest average in writing in, in, in the writing module of the IELTS, but they don't have a similar band in speaking. And that is primarily because we don't speak English the way the rest of the world in the standard varieties, uh, you know, elsewhere do. How can we do that? Now we cannot create another English man or woman here. So then, you know, we think of Michael West and what is minimum essential? What is it we must teach? Michael West was an English teacher in the Bengal of early 20th century. And incidentally, he got the first DPhil in ELT at Oxford. So, you know, one of those things, what is the basic reading list? What is the basic word list? What is simplified reader? You know, what is it that must be learned so that we stay local, but we are globally understood? Like, you know, I can understand Eric and Paula, you and Prem and other friends and can expect to be understood. So then when we asked ourselves these questions, we found that there wasn't much and it was doable. If we taught them how to stress a word, maybe speak a little bit slowly, keep the order of words all right, then, you know, we have done it. Everybody can then speak and be understood. Everybody can acquire fluency and confidence. All we need by way of external support is a pat on the back saying, okay, you are doing all right. And as, as the British say, the proof of pudding is in eating. You know, we have had considerable amount of success following these local, you know, traditions of global problems. So to wind up, let me come back. I see decentering as finding your own sustainable, locally viable solutions. Why emphasize learning of sentences? You know, I mean, overemphasize. Why must we be correct only grammatically and not morphologically, not lexically? Let's first create a vocabulary of 1500 words, which is not easy, just bisyllabic words, frequently occurring, 50% of them can be nouns, 30% can be verbs, remaining 20% can include adverbs, adjectives, articles, pronouns, etc., etc. 
let there be a predominance of bisyllabic and monosyllabic words trisyllabic and polysyllabic words can follow and in within those 1500 words we can give enough confidence and there are websites there are dictionaries which tell you which are those 3000 words that are used most frequently and must be learned first enough dictionaries all we need to do is to have the courage to implement it and to tell the governments sorry you are no longer realistic please allow me to go my way but governments pola please believe me worldwide maybe your country is different governments are huge hurdles to anything good including learning please pardon me at my age i think i i i perhaps have become a cynic but i see this alone as the way thank you if you have any questions i will try to answer but i'm not too sure if i can answer all questions thank you thank sure. you very much Yeah. Thank you Shreya thank you for that interesting um for sharing your interesting views perspectives on this um we are going to uh, possibly come back to some of the the issues being raised here um um i don't know if amol you are able to pick up uh, some of the questions some of the comments that are uh, coming um, from the chat we can talk about that uh, later after we finish with our last but not least uh, uh has nice here with us So um yeah. has I'm going to give you some minutes for you to share your understanding of the centering NLT. Yeah. So hi everybody. Uh at the beginning the centering NLT is a concept that is in you here in Gaza specifically in Gaza specifically or in Palestine in general. And at the beginning I have a, a very difficult point of view to understand what's the meaning of the definition and what do we need by that because we usually face by two things the first thing that we usually ask especially in gaza so why do we learn english as long as we would never leave gaza because of the political situation so students are not able to uh, speak or uh, they are not even interested in learning english itself because we will not be able to leave gaza because of the border because of the blockade but because of the siege and that make them learn so little or not even interested in addition to many difficulties that we live here in gaza the other thing that um, made me think about it that uh, we usually have a lot of courses about teaching uh, teachers and educating teachers about the best ways of learning uh, teaching english and usually these best ways of teaching english is a global ways so uh, the aim of them uh, to help teachers to face the challenges the obstacles that they have to adapt their classes uh, to use these uh, like global education uh, techniques but unfortunately most of these courses that we talk about uh, adapting and elaborating and being better teaching by using all these global or centering uh, uh, teaching methods uh, have become a burden on both teachers and the students because teachers have to try all of them and it's not working on the Palestinian classes because we have many difficulties the first one is that we have overcrowded and these overcrowded uh, overcrowded the classes which exceed to 50 students in the class and having two shifts morning and afternoon shifts and after the last aggression we have a free shift so you have limited time you don't have time to do all these and most of them are not successful in our classes as i said such as for example anything related to critical thinking because it is a cultural thing not to critic people or not to criticize people so i couldn't understand or to give the definition for decentering elt without having the political and the social and the economic background So for me this centering ELT is the process of teaching English as a second language uh with the understanding uh that and with understanding the minimum resources that we have and uh, acknowledging the impact of the political uh, circumstances such as wars aggressions and in addition to that the impact of economic and social difficulties such as female minor uh, female minors marriages and poverty 
And all that, in, in addition to that, the students try to put and the channel all their, their experiences and expertise in teaching English and finding and forming the best and the most effective ways in teaching English in a very sustainable way. And I found that we have something, unfortunately, is that sometimes we shame teachers who are not be, uh, who are not able to use these global techniques. You know, sometimes when we have like, uh, you know, we have like visit exchange between the schools or being other teachers, and they are like the teacher will explain, it's more about the techniques they, that he used or how many techniques he used in these classes, even if they're not successful in their classes. So for me, decentering ELT has different maybe concepts than others, but it is about making more students able to think that English is not hard as they think. It's about that it is not necessary you must learn English because you will need to leave your country or you can travel your country. Um, also for me, uh, decentering ELT is advanced and it needs more more, uh, how can I say it, more thinking and more explaining to understand from, because it is different from one country to another country. I understand most of what they talked about, about having like, for example, differences between teachers are from public schools and teachers are from private schools. Here in Gaza, we don't have that because most of English teachers are like having a positive attitude towards, it, towards uh, teaching English. And they have like all all um, all the resources that they have, but also it is limited in a one way or another. It is related to internet. It is related to uh, how we will see it. And as I said, as long as you use more global techniques, you are a better teacher. You are not able to use these techniques. You should work more on yourself, and you have to work more harder. So that's my point to you. Thank you, Hasna. Thank you very much for that. Um, that was a very interesting um, take on what the centering means to you. Um, we have had a very interesting set of uh, points being raised here by all the members of the panel. So I now would like to just give you a few of extra minutes. Um, we don't have that much time, unfortunately, but just about five minutes to um, open the floor to any of you. You can let me know if you, Prem, Eri, Gracia, Hasna, or Shresh, would like to add something based on the on the different views shared by fellow panelists. So, if anything that they say just triggers some thought or may make you want make you express something else, just let me know. Prem, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, highlight uh, what I have actually missed. Uh, in in my um, yeah in my talk before so uh, this this whole notion of teacher training actually is um, in many ways uh, for me is dehumanizing particularly in the context of periphery so we often treat uh, teachers as trainable subjects like you know uh, the the animals who are ready to be kind of trained right so and. And what happens is basically we expect that teachers coming to us, basically us basically means, you know, <laughs> who, who are kind of like in, in higher education or universities or plus maybe uh, kind of like uh, coming from different contexts, right? So then these teachers are trained, but we don't basically understand where they come from and what is what are their values, what are their socio-cultural realities and context. So, and then what happens is they, we expect them to try these things, right? Try out these things, what we tell them to, uh, to apply in their school, but that does not really work. So this whole notion of teacher training as uh, something that, uh, you know, that addresses, um, you know, the problems or issues as we have discussed here in, in different contexts uh, is something really problematic. And we need, we really, I'm, I'm not saying just like the models of teacher training now, but the whole notion of teacher training or training as such is actually uh, not recognizing 
teachers' struggles and their agencies, values, ideologies are in many ways very effective knowledge and skills in, in different parts of the world, um, in, 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 in the periphery, for example. So um, I think uh, one, uh, one key areas, uh, one of the key areas of decentering ELT should be, I think maybe we need to really question you know, what we have been doing in, in, in the broader rubrics of teacher training or teacher training schools or teacher training uh, organizations and how uh, actually we are positioning teachers and how do, uh, what do we expect from them? So basically, I think that is what I wanted to uh, I wanted to raise uh, the questions here. So how do we basically uh, recognize teachers, agencies, knowledge, and skills they they actually have built uh, by teaching for long, uh, as Suresh has just highlighted in different difficult uh, situations. So, but at the same time, it's not just recognition of what these teachers are doing in local context context of difficult circumstances, but also redistribution of their knowledge, right? Um, as, as legitimate knowledge and skills in, in teaching English uh, uh, in, in other contexts as well. So both recognition and redistribution of knowledge is, is, is really important. Thank you, Paula. Yes. Thank you, Brem. Thank you for that, for that additional reflection uh, on an important uh, topic. Anybody would like to add anything? Gracia, go ahead. Can I, can I pull up? Sure. Can okay, but, Gracia and then Shresh. Yeah, but Gracia, but Gracia first, please. Thank you. Thank you. So something that resonated with me from what Tresh and Hasna were mentioning is that as we embark in this process of decentering ELT, we need to be aware of all of the aspects and not only the focus on materials and training, but be aware of all the aspects, all the contexts, all the needs and the realities of each classroom, of each local context. Understand the who, the how, the what right? We're going to embark in that process of decentering ELT in the different places, those perspectives that we need to keep in mind. And, and thinking about what Shresh was saying regarding access or exposure, right? Those are things that, are, that come into play into this process. Also, in reading the comments in the chat, I can see how important it becomes to understand the nuances of each country and address decentering ELT based on those particular characteristics and situations, because we cannot come again and, and, and follow the same trend of having a standardized approach to decentering ELT. So I think that's why this conversation is really important because we are looking at all the perspectives. We're not coming with one definition that really drives yeah. what we're doing, but we are thinking about how can we use all those perspectives to bring that local perspective into the game. Thank you, Gracia. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Shresh, would you like to continue? Right. I, I, you know, pardon me, I don't quite agree with Prem, you know, when we say, you know, I mean, it, it, it can be a very distorted view of training to think that imparting training is creating, is, is, is something subhuman or dehumanizing. I don't think so, you know. I mean, training, so long as we recognize that teaching is not always a, a biologically natural activity of human beings, there is some kind of skill, there is some kind of process and product involved, then it is always useful that we learn from the experience of our ancestors. The problem with teacher training is not that there is quote unquote something called training. Training also has a larger connotation. You know, how do we learn riding a bicycle unless somebody runs behind you, unless somebody helps you mount the saddle? Okay. So, in that sense, you know, we have to create, we have to train in a larger sense our teachers to think to create their own resources out of nothing, you know, to create their own materials out of local knowledge, using a global language, 
you know, you cannot have both as strangers. You know, language and content, they both need not be strange. You can have the same content in the new language. You can have the new content in the same language. But if we train our teachers adequately, or if we educate them, sensitize them, use the word you are most comfortable with, if we create a fraternity of colleagues who can innovate, who understand the local problems, whose competence, whose, whose minimum competence in the language they are going to teach at least is, you know, is, is, is of a certain level. And if that is not, then we can help them as well, or we can train them to train themselves. In that sense, you know, training definitely is desirable and we must strive to create a culture where people train themselves to innovate according to situation. Then there are local specific problems. As I told you, the problem of global intelligibility of our local pronunciations. Now, should we change everything? The teacher therefore, you know, a sensitive teacher therefore would know how much must change so that a colleague in Gaza or a colleague in Nepal or a colleague in Latin America must understand somebody from a village in India. Now that sensitivity is required there and that by that I mean the target is global. We can no longer afford to be no matter which country, where we come from, we are no longer isolated pockets. It's a matter of time when leveling, you know, country levels like now would become just cultural levels. You know, the technology has almost wiped out local boundaries. So the goal is global. We all have to understand one another. And it so happens by accident of history that just now this language is English. It used to be French. It used to be before that Persian and Turkish. Turkish was the maritime language, even in Asia. No matter Portuguese or British, they had to learn Turkish to sail on Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea, and also to a large extent on other oceans. Today, it happens to be English. Tomorrow, it will be something else, maybe Chinese, maybe Hindi, maybe a Spanish. But the problem would remain. And for that, we must find local solution and we must prepare, you know, perhaps training is not a good word. Maybe we also train dogs to, you know, pick up our tennis balls and bring them back to us. So let's use another word. Let's say educate. We may need to educate our teachers such that they adequately understand the local problem. They are capable of finding and delivering solutions. That, in my opinion, will be the right understanding of decentry. Thank you, Shresh. Thank you. Sorry, I would like to leave a few minutes. Um, I know that we are a bit over time, um, Debbie. Uh, and Amo, um, but I would like to give five minutes at least for Eric and Hasna to um, be able to express themselves and then um, just use our last 10 minutes or so to look at um, either questions or comments and then some final remarks, okay, if that's okay with you. So uh, would you like to um, um, use some of that time, Eric? Yeah, sure. I can just queue up from what Shri is saying. Um, mm -hmm. about a teacher's um, a trainers in, in, uh, who must have skills to train, uh, to be able to, to, to teach in teacher training colleges. One of the key problems with teacher training is that it centers the teacher. It makes the teacher the center. That is a key problem. So it is, it is a way of finding, um, this is, we have to find a way of um, getting a process of training that decenters the teacher instead of centering him uh, in the classroom. And what happens is that when the teachers get to the classroom, 
And the kind of training generally, what is common is a craft model in many parts of the periphery, the craft model of training. And, and what, what, what happens is when these teachers get to the field and they confront the monster, learning a language or another language, now they start producing or generating practices which unconsciously are revolutionary in scope and dimension. And then at a certain point, you find um, these same teachers telling you there is a marked difference between training and practice because the context of practice is unreal in training. Now, what this tells us is that decentering is uh, an idea generated by an individual with uh, the uh, and with the interest of finding satisfaction or uh, finding a solution or having uh, an achievement in what they're doing. Now, in this process, um, I read, I read, I read uh, Harry's comment that we have not talked about teacher research and I think it's very important we, 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 we talk about this. Uh, teacher research to me is a process of decentering. It's not, it, 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 we, we can claim that it is itself, well, from my view, a, a, a decentering process, a, 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 an aspect of decentering, rather the process through which teachers emancipate themselves from the kind of uh, center ideologies which training has uh, implanted in them. Uh, now, this tells us that decentering at a certain point if we, if we look at it keenly, is kind of negative feedback to training. Unless we are claiming that the teacher training schools are developing a bank of processes and methodologies based on classroom feedback. And if this is not yet the point, then I think that teacher training is a center and finding local solutions to local problems probably through teacher research can be the dissenter. Thank Paola, you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Well, Eric, I agree with you <laughs> uh, on that point. Uh, so Hasna, could we just go with you on your final words? Yeah, um, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. The first time we talked about decentering, I went to my school and I sat with my uh, English teachers colleagues and they started like, okay, tell me what do you think about decentering? And we started pulling information from each other. The next day they came to me with having different, totally different ideas about decentering and we started discussing it. And we have been like since two weeks ago until now we have been decentering every day we have been discussing decentering every day from every point of view which always different from the other one. But the main reason that, that this became something interesting is we weren't aware that there is many aspects of teaching English. We weren't aware that it is not always the global way is the right way to teach. And we actually use local ways and we use local solutions and we face our challenges in our classes in, in a different way. And every teacher has or has, uh, has his own way to deal with the, the obstacles that they face in the classes. But we did not know that this is decentering. We did not know that this is putting your local expertise and your local thoughts about how to deal with these situations. And that's what I like. When, when we have such discussions, our point of reviews will be wider and wider and we can reflect to reflect that to our colleagues, our students. And I'm thinking that now I will go and I'll say, like, we have different points of view. We have one, two, three, four, and we have like the whole world is here and we can collect information from the whole world. So that's what I'm really, ha like, I'm really delighted to have this conversation. Thank you guys. Thank you, Hasna. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to leave the floor to Amal, who is also a chair of this panel, and to see whether you would like to 
mention any questions that has been raised or any comments that we have received from the chat box or through Facebook. So I leave the floor to you, Amo. Yep, uh, thank you, Paula. And uh, let me confess right in the beginning that it's literally impossible for me and probably for many of us to keep track of the massive amount of discussion that's going on in the chat box. How I wish we were all in Delhi in one place as originally planned and in the same room. It would have been such a rich and fantastic exchange. And uh, I also apologize in advance that I'm bound to miss quite a few things because it has been such rich, diverse and so many parallel strands going on in the discussion. But what I notice as a kind of common trend uh, or common concerns uh, featuring across all kinds of discussions uh, are two things, in, that's my personal view. One is a feeling that if we want to deepen our understanding of decentering, we also need to look at notions of the center and have a complex nuanced understanding of the center. Different people have put forth their views uh, or their own perspectives on the center, including the panelists. For example, how Prem talked about multiple centers and that has echoed in uh, the postings of different people as well. And it's not a very easy way and there can't be one exhaustive definition that uh, will adequately explain uh, the notion of center in all contexts. But <clears throat> From the Facebook chat, there is an interesting hint which might uh, take us to a more nuanced understanding of center. The, uh, the phrase uh, that discriminatory nature or practices. So if we are talking of the center and the decentering practices, if we are talking of questions of access or uh, irrelevance of solutions coming from other places, we are essentially going to the roots of some kind of discrimination happening there. So probably that might be one hint or one clue towards a deeper understanding of the center and decentering. Another word uh, or notion that figured in several posts in, in the chat is the notion of the local, not necessarily the same word everywhere, but that the notion of the local. And once again, it seems that the general sense is local is something that cannot be defined universally applicable to all contexts everywhere. And uh, I particularly liked the kind of link uh, Professor Shrish Chaudhary made uh, between the local and the global. And many people picked on that, even on the Facebook, that local and global are kind of integrally connected to each other. And uh, while looking at one, we should not lose sight of the other which is in a way uh, a productive decentering way of looking at our reality. In terms of questions, there are two or three questions which I could pick up. Uh, and those questions were common to a uh, couple of people, so I'm not taking anybody's name. But one question is about, <clears throat> let me quickly check, I have noted it here. One question is about uh, checking the impact of decentering initiatives or what gains the case studies presented yesterday led to or what kind of things have been achieved uh, out of those things. The question is, if we are asking such kind of impact assessment, then isn't it fair to ask in the first place, what has been the impact of the current centrist practices? And if there hasn't been any fair impact assessment of whatever we have been following so far, why should we wonder about or puzzle about, worry about the impact of decentering practices? And uh, uh, do you think, Paula, we should ask uh, maybe one of the panelists to respond to this? Or yes, shall I go ahead? so um, I think maybe what we should do is um, you pose a question and then one of the panelists, the first one that raises their hand to answer the question, and it needs to be answered rather briefly in like a minute or so, so that we allow, because there are two more questions that are coming in the chat box so that we allow for at least two or three yeah. questions to be answered. Would that work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay so the me... question, um, Eric, you want to answer that question? Yeah, I want to try, I want to try something. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. 
Um, <coughs> we, we aren't going to be talking about trying to understand what is happening as far as the centering is concerned when we don't understand the, the effect of that decentering process, then we will spend time hypothesizing. I have the, imp I have the imp impression that our understanding of decentering right now is to give value to what is happening. And having that impact assessment to me is a way of giving value. Let me take, for example, we agree that there is a lot of decentering happening out there, which we don't know. And in structures of hierarchy, in context of hierarchy, most of these practitioners who get engaged in decentering practices do not really feel in themselves that what they are doing is something that can be um, projected as a good practice. And so because of the ways through which their societies have structured their minds, okay, they think, okay, this thing just worked for me. Okay, great. Now, if we don't find a way of getting the same um, decentering practitioners, understand how valuable their practice, their practices have been from learner perspective, we would spend a lot of time stealing the show. We would talk, sit in our offices and talk about decentering and without being able to measure the impact of decentering on the very people who matter in the decentering process. That is my approach to it. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Amo, would you like to um, raise yeah, another uh, question? Thank you so much. And there are a couple of questions uh, regarding the practice of decentering. And uh, one question is, uh, can any of the panelists give some examples of how a local solution can lead to decentering? Would someone like to respond to that? Shresh? You see, there has been a very, an extremely unfortunate impression has been created that it, it happens with most prestige languages. So therefore it should not be surprising that there is only one grammar and that it can be done only this way. In, in a country like India, where no quote unquote indigenous <laughs> language is monolithic. You know, Amol and I speak languages in certain regions of our country, which themselves have many local varieties and think of English as spread over, as spoken by people who learned it before they were born and who have been learning it ever since. There can be multiple varieties. In that sense, you know, we, we should have encouraged a culture that you are right, you are not wrong, so long as you achieve an X, Y, Z. That X, Y, Z still remains undefined and vaguely we insist, unless every consonant, unless every vowel, is pronounced the way a certain dictionary or a certain professor of a certain university does, that has resulted, not that they have directly said so, but over decades, an impression has been created that only this and nothing else is the right model to learn, which has resulted in very frustrating you know, disappointing consequences. So first thing we must change, look at the example of teaching pronunciation. You know, we teach everything all over India. You know, we teach grammar, vocabulary, writing, literature, Shakespeare, Chaucer, today's poet, yesterday's playwright. But we dare not teach pronunciation because or lest we should go wrong. Now that's an example and it's a serious one, you know. Today, even Indian companies have become multinational. There are Indian companies which work in dozens of countries. Actually, you know, think of Tata Consultancy, think of Infosys, 
there are people from over a hundred countries and English is about the only way in which you could interact with customers, with colleagues, with prospective clients. Now, unless we create this culture of, okay, there is this English language and you must have X and like everyone else, but Y and Z, A, B, C and D can differ. You know, it's not a shame if I understand that Eric is different from the one in Lancaster or in Shropshire. So that unfortunate emphasis must go. What must come is a clearly defined that this is the minimum required. And if you do that, you know, same thing with the teacher education. Why can't we learn from our own experience? Get together periodically. And you know, Amol will agree that in certain states of India, they have done that. The teachers get together once a month or once in a quarter, exchange their, you know, consult each other about their problems. And somebody has tried something and it has worked. In, it has worked in teaching of grammar, in teaching of spelling, in teaching of a variety of things. You know, there is no, even in IELTS, Paula, with your permission, I'm taking a few seconds longer than perhaps you have. Even in IELTS training, I had a flock of over 60 teachers to train and everyone cert certificate successfully. Once I told them, coherence and cohesion may sound abstract, but it's a problem of using your pronouns, articles and prepositions, some adverbs correctly. Check that and you will never go wrong. And we checked that and we never went wrong. 60 out of 60 certificated every year. The problem is the confidence that we need in our own innovations. There it is shaky, you know, unless it has the stamp of the British Council, unless the stamp of a mole, unless somebody in authority says, this is okay, we hesitate, local governments hesitate, local bosses, head of the department hesitates and it stifles the initiative of a young colleague. That is where I agree with Prem, you know. That allow teacher, give, teacher is not a, teacher is not a paid lorry loader. Teacher is a craftsman. He is creating, she is creating careers. Let there be some fun in the class. Fun has disappeared from the class because of overemphasis upon centering. Sorry, Paula, I took longer than I intended to. That's okay. Thank you, Shresh. Um, oh, Amol, do we have time for the last question? Or yeah, yeah, one, uh, one probably final one more question. question there. Yeah, there have been several posts uh, discussing uh, how it's important to recognize teachers' expertise, teachers' abilities, competence, their skills, their knowledge value that and build on that for arriving at local solutions, locally relevant solutions. In that sense, is there uh, a suggestion that centering actually leads to de-skilling or uh, reducing the capacities of uh, teachers or taking away from them their competence of thinking on the ground, on their feet and doing things which, are, which they find appropriate and relevant? So is that a kind of uh, feature we would attach to centering? I don't, um, I know, I know Shresh and Eric have, have already shared their opinions, but since Prem um, was so passionate about training teachers, I don't know if you would like something, would have something to say about this? Um, yeah, I, uh, okay, my, I think uh, there is no, I think, one perfect right uh, answer. Uh, the first thing is uh, because the, the whole notion of teach, I, I was just like questioning the whole notion of teacher training, you know, the whole epistemology, the history of teacher training uh, in ELT, basically. So uh, for me, um, maybe in, in it depends on the context, but uh, the way teacher training remains at the center of ELT now, right, uh, is something that actually uh, is not really working for me, actually, in many ways. Um, 
dehumanizing I I, I I really use dehumanizing because it's not really recognizing what teachers have been doing right what teachers have actually uh, struggle for uh, ma for many reasons uh, for example negotiating socio-cultural context uh, lack of resources um, and but constantly they are evaluated by someone or basically the Ministry of Education and, and their, their people who don't actually understand how teachers are, you know, what is the situation of the teachers actually. So in, for me, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a very difficult question, but uh, the way the teacher training is actually conceptualized to ask teachers to do something and then evaluate just because of, you know, evaluate in terms of those methodological prescriptions that is invented or constructed, I would, I would say somewhere by someone uh, and, and with, with an assumption that that would work all over the, all over the world is something actually dehumanizing for me. And it's not really diversifying ELT knowledge, actually. So, so in, in many ways, for me, uh, it contributes to the skilling of, of, of teachers. Um, yeah, uh, again, it depends on how we, uh, how we see things, but uh, you know, uh, my, my experience actually tells basically uh, the, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's not really working well. Thank you very much, Prem. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to now uh, bring the discussion to a close. Amo, if that's okay with you? Yeah, yeah, it's time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amo, for that. Thank you uh, to all of our panelists. I would like just to say a few words, just uh, I, I just kind of make a very brief uh, succinct summary with the key lines or messages from different discussion, different things being told here. Amo just made a summary of also of the different things being said um, in the chat box and through Facebook. So there are different things that appear to be interesting here. Some of them might have been repeated. I'm sorry about that. So basically um, uh, there seems to be, uh, there was uh, some talk about, um, when we talk about decentering, we need to also talk about not only providing a framework for decentering to exist or to happen, but uh, the, talking about, we were talking about decentering opportunities based on what Gracia mentioned. By the way, I need to say that Gracia had to leave. She had a previous commitment. So um, from a distance, we would like to appreciate her contribution, but she had another commitment this morning. Uh, well, sorry, morning for, for us in Latin America. Um, so she talked about providing decentering opportunities. Um, talk, she talked about localizing and empowering localized expertise. You have all mentioned that at some point. So if teachers do not have all opportunities for um, for having access to that knowledge, then we are preventing inclusion and equality. So the, uh, the centering views also need to think about equality, um, um, equity, uh, uh, inclusion, and providing opportunities. Um, and then there were some questions that Prem raised that were interesting. Is ELT about learning English that is used only at the center? And whether maybe our approaches should be multilingual instead? Something that was also mentioned in some way by Shresh also. And then acknowledging local expertise was mentioned again, teacher education needs to be decentered as well. Um, so teacher research uh, is seen as a decentering uh, process that could allow teachers to, um, to show their, how they have understood their local practices. So to acknowledge their own understandings of the processes. Local varieties of Englishes should be equally acknowledged again, uh, something mentioned here as well. They need to change the target to, they need to change your views of a target view of English to a more global, okay, instead of a single uh, way of looking at English. Um, looking at decentering as a process of teaching English language, English as a foreign language, with an understanding of the minimum resources that we have as well seems to be important and acknowledging political and social issues, uh, which is a point, a very important point raised by Hasna. And then also something that mentioned, uh, Shresh mentioned, and um, and he actually mentioned AMO and it made me aware of things that I have discussed elsewhere with you at some point in different occasions that we have met is the importance of if we are trying to, if we see centering EFL as a potential danger of, uh, I, you know, disregarding local practices, maybe us, those of us who are considered to be kind of in a power position in terms of having 
um, a word or a voice in our respective context, we need to be aware of maybe becoming the center of EFL in our respective contexts and the possible danger uh, of that. So um, we, what we don't want to, what we want to avoid is for then for us to become uh, the center again in our uh, in our in our uh, respective uh, contexts. And so if anything, as a final note, um, the fact that we have multiple views and multiple perspectives seems to be an asset. So um, uh, the idea of local versus global, you mentioned it uh, as well, um, was widely expressed. So use local perspectives for global understandings seem to be a key message. And uh, there's also something that Prem mentioned that I think was uh, also agreed, which is I need to, there is, seems to be this need to standardize and um, homogenize understandings of English language teaching and different perspectives. And maybe we should, we should need to avoid, we might uh, uh, avoid a standardizing and be set, uh, a sta a standardizing um, and homogenizing our understandings of decentering ELT as well. Just otherwise we're just going to go back to the same trap. Um, so uh, that is all uh, that I was able to capture from our conversation. Um, thank you very much uh, for all our panelists. Thank you uh, to all of those who make this discussion possible. Thank you for your time. And I'll leave you now with Richard, who is going to close this session. Thank you.